Hello and welcome to today's webinar on early military resources at NEHGS. My name is Ginevra Morse, the Director of Education and Online Programs at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history. And today's webinar was made possible by our annual fund, and we're pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation will be David Allen Lambert, our Chief Genealogist. He's been with the Society for more than 20 years and is an expert in New England and Atlantic Canadian research, military records, and Native American and African American genealogical research. Today, David will first go over some basic steps of military research. He'll then discuss resources for the colonial wars, the American Revolution, and the War of 1812. Um, so those resources that are available and both online and on site at NEHGS, as well as other repositories. He'll also provide helpful research tips throughout his presentation. This webinar is intended as a really broad and brief overview of the types of resources you'd find here at NEHGS. Um, I know David could easily give a webinar or even several webinars on each of the military conflicts, um, but after today's presentation, you will receive a survey asking what type of military research you're most interested in. Um, and from your responses, we may decide to offer a full webinar just on that subject. At any time during the presentation, feel free to type a question in the question panel to the right of your screen. David will answer as many as he can um, in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour. If you don't see that question box, you can expand your user panel by clicking on the icon of a white arrow with an orange background, and you should see that on the right of your screen. Finally, as a reminder, we are recording this event, and we'll post the video to our website in the next couple of days. So without further ado, I will turn things over to David. Thank you, Ginevra. In genealogy, I like to focus on stories. I believe it makes the life of an individual more interesting. As the chief genealogist of any HDS, of course I am concerned with primary sources and names and dates. However, the clues of an oral history can often take you on a new research adventure to uncover truth and the proof of these oral traditions. In colonial military research, you will often find generations connected by many years of military service. A young soldier from the French and Indian War may later see service in the Revolutionary War. This is what I found as I researched my ancestor, Jonathan Poor of Newbury, Massachusetts. In fact, he raised a company of men which had been in the French and Indian War with him to march on the alarm of Lexington and Concord. I'm going to go over some basic steps of military research, which you will find applicable to the three tiers of this webinar. Step one, we'll talk about determining if your ancestor fought. This will basically be applicable by his age. Was the age of your ancestor suitable for military service? Also, we'll talk about what family heirlooms and traditions say about your ancestor. Perhaps you have something in the attic or a story that your ancestors told you that tie in to this military tradition. Then we'll get into research in step two, talking about documents and artifacts. We'll try not to recreate the wheel and tell you about genealogies and published local histories that may tell the story for you. Or maybe you need to reinvent the wheel and find the sources they used. We'll also discuss online resources between NEHCS's website, American Ancestors, and the commercial website, Fold3. And then lastly, we'll talk step three about seeking or applying to hereditary societies. The colonial wars are the period of American history that we often find our ancestors involved in. For defense of their home to the structure of the community's military troops, your ancestor may have taken up arms to defend against the Native American population or the invading French from Canada. So colonial war records are something that a lot of people don't dwell into too detailed in their research, primarily because the records are muster rolls. Muster rolls can often be 
very limited in what the scope and the detail. But I'll talk about adopting the regimen and learning more about the people your ancestor fought with. So these limited records become more bountiful. Step one, to determine if he fought. How old was your veteran? Now, I like to say typically veterans are between the ages of 18 and 35. There are, of course, extremes. Perhaps your ancestor's son was a drummer boy or a musician in the local militia band that marched off. Or perhaps you had a very able-bodied senior citizen in your family tree who was a senior soldier, still able to level a musket when the time came for his service. One thing I also like to point out is that your ancestor may have not served for a variety of reasons, but maybe he was not physically or mentally fit to serve. Perhaps he had an ailment or an injury, suffering from smallpox, or perhaps that he was on his deathbed and died soon after. Take these into consideration when you don't find your ancestor who should typically fit into a muster roll, and he does not. We're going to talk now sort of an overview of some of the colonial wars that took place on the Atlantic seaboard with a specific detail geared to New England related battles. So let's talk about what colonial wars occurred during your ancestors' lifetime. The first war we will discuss is a military conflict known as the Pequot War, which occurred between 1636 and 1638. New England expansion into the Connecticut region would lead to the hostilities by the local Pequot Indians. The major battle in this conflict was the Puritan attack on Fort Mystic on the morning of May 26, 1637. My own ancestor, Reverend William Thompson of Braintree, Massachusetts, was the clergy traveling with the troops in Massachusetts at this battle. Sadly, many women and children were also killed during this battle. The fort was also burned to the ground. Many Pequots were sadly sold into slavery to other tribes allied with the Puritans. The one thing about the experience of the Pequot War is that you can learn about it. If you've ever been to Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut, I would suggest going to the Mashantucket Pequot Museum, where the story of the Pequot Indians is told in vivid detail. And in recent years, archaeological work where Fort Mystic was has been undertaken. The next military conflict we're going to chat about is King Philip's War. This was the first full-scale New England war in the 17th century. Metacomet, also known as King Philip, was the youngest son of Massasoit, the friend to the Pilgrim Fathers of Plymouth Colony. After John Sassaman, a Christian Indian, was found murdered under the ice of Lake Assawamsett in Lakeville, Massachusetts, three Wampanoag Indians were executed by the colonists. This incited anger and hostilities by King Philip's warriors. Philip and members of the Wampanoag Nation had resisted the efforts to be Christianized and the encroachment upon their land for over 50 years, most likely led to the animosity. By the time Philip was killed in August of 1676, several thousand colonists and Indians had died. Dozens of communities in New England had been destroyed and the cost is estimated at 100,000 pounds in damages. Reverend George Madison Bodge's book, recently republished by NEHTS, is one of the best pieces of scholarship on the colonial soldiers involved. This includes muster rolls from the records of the Massachusetts State Archives, are included to aid the researcher in determining an ancestor's involvement in the war. I was honored to be able to write the foreword to this current edition. The Glorious Revolution of 1688, which brought William of Orange to the British throne, would lead to the following year with England declaring war on France, hence the King William's War of 1689 through 1697. Count Frontenac planned a full-scale invasion of New York. In fact, Schenectady, New York, would be invaded and burned by a French force coming down from Canada, including over 200 French and 100 Indians. These troops would continue into the frontiers of what are now Maine and New Hampshire. In retaliation, Sir William Phipps led an attack on Port Royal Acadia, now Nova Scotia, and a failed attempt to capture later Quebec City was undertaken. In the mid-1990s, the remains of a sunken vessel from the Phipps expedition to Quebec was found in the St. Lawrence River. Remains of guns and swords were located and some personal artifacts that were able to be associated with soldiers from both Dorchester, Massachusetts and Newbury, Massachusetts. 
My own ancestor, William Longfellow, who I joined the Colonial Wars, perished aboard this vessel in 1690. After King Louis XIV had an attempt to place his grandson as the King of Spain, the retaliation of all of Europe led to England's personal involvement. The wish of Europe was not to have Europe dominated by French influence. Raids by French and Indians from Canada into northern New England communities were one of the direct effects of this European war on the North American continent. The attack on Deerfield, Massachusetts is one of the most studied attacks which occurred in 1704. Massachusetts troops captured Port Royal once again in 1710, and they also led a failed attempt once again to attack Quebec in 1711. King George's War, which occurred from 1740 to 1748, was one of the key battles of this war, was actually the capture of Fortress Louisbourg in Cape Breton in modern-day Nova Scotia in 1745. Many involvement of New England soldiers took part in this, as well as the Allied regular British troops. The Treaty of A La Chapelle in 1748 would return the fortress back to French control. NEHGS has various manuscripts in relation to the King George's War and the French and Indian War in the R. Stanton Avery archives, which I would suggest you peruse for your own ancestors. The French and Indian War. The seven years in the Europe of this war, known as the Seven Years' War, from 1754 to 1763. The conflict had started over border disputes between the colonists of France and England and the New World two years previously. The recapture of Louisbourg in 1759, the exile of the Acadians uh, to back to France, to Quebec, and to the American colonies, and the loss of Quebec to the English in 1760 were major defeats of the French control over the New World. Thousands perished in the battles throughout North America and Canada. Many soldiers who would serve the British Army and the local militias during the French and Indian War would later serve against this King George III in the American Revolutionary War. Okay, one of the things I like to say about New Englanders, well, we never throw anything out. And if we do, sometimes it ends up at NEHGS. So we like to think of our archives as a wonderful um, archives that could contain papers that maybe your family had long ago lost and maybe we have perhaps required. So I like to think what might be in the attic. So one of the things that you want to do when you're doing genealogy is to, to check with your own clues. Do you have any uh, 18th or 17th century family ephemera or documents that you have? If you don't, you might want to call cousin, your cousin up on the telephone who cleaned out grandma's house. Maybe she has it. Do you know of a sword or a musket or a journal or a powder horn that's engraved? These are wonderful things that you can find that may have a clue to early colonial wars. Also check museums and archives, both on a state level and also in a local level in the towns and cities that your ancestors once lived. Another place that you'd be surprised are online auction catalogs. You never know who may have acquired something decades before and is now reselling it. On eBay, a commercial online auction house, which I'm sure you're familiar with, lists thousands of 17th and 18th century military items each year. Perhaps the powder horn, the journal, or some other family artifact will surface while you're doing a search on eBay. An example of something that you could find online for sale is typically a commission. Now this military commission may have been awarded to an ancestor of yours and may be a personal family heirloom still framed in your possession. You may also find it on eBay or hopefully at NEHGS. NEHGS has a large collection of 18th century military documents I had mentioned. Of this contain personal commissions awarded to people for their service and the increase of their rank. This particular commission dates to 1758. Examine the inventory of your ancestors' colonial probate. It may reveal military ephemera that they once possessed. It may be a flintlock musket, a powder horn, or even a drum. Inventories can truly offer you a glimpse back into time of your ancestors' possessions and can often piece together their trade, or in this case, their military service. 
Step two, research. One of the things I like to tell people is, are that you want to use published sources for the 17th and 18th century. I'll show you how to use our library catalog on American ancestors shortly to actually and to take a search to find these published accounts. Compilations of colonial soldiers don't need to be reinvented. They're probably already in print for you. Published histories of battles and wars and narratives of the same are also quite easily obtained. NEHTS has tens to thousands of historical books that deal with these historical conflicts, which I'll be speaking of. Another organizational publication you may be aware of are the Connected Hereditary Society publications. Maybe the Society of Colonial Wars, the SAR, the DAR, or others. They will often have compilations, transcriptions of journals and diaries that will aid you in learning more about your ancestors' service during these conflicts. What I have in front of you here is the American Ancestors website. What I've initiated is a subject search under French and Indian War. So I'm going to now click on search. What I am given are 156 matches for the French and Indian War. Now I can narrow this down further under a subject or title search by adding in a particular colony name. Perhaps I'd search on Connecticut in the French and Indian War, or Massachusetts in the French and Indian War. But I think you understand where I'm getting that the more detail you add, the further it will narrow it down. Chances are we may not have a journal that was written by your ancestor, but it doesn't hurt to check. So do plug that into the catalog search, and you might find that we have something exciting awaiting for you. Tip, seek out the primary source. And that's so very important because a lot of these wonderful compilations were done more than a century ago. When using published accounts, diaries, or muster rolls, you want to seek out the primary source, just for your own surety. This may be done by simply consulting the bibliography or the footnotes of the book you're using. If you have any difficulty in determining the source, in fact, the original primary source, consider contacting myself or one of my colleagues at NEHS to help you. Oftentimes in archives will allow you to actually go in and digitally photograph the primary source. It's much clearer than a microfilm print or a photocopy, and muster rolls can often be oversized paper, so they can't be laid on a photocopy or on a typically a flatbed scanner anyways. This will allow you to get all the names as well as color images of the primary source, and it will be, start, will be the start of what you can do to adopt the regiment, which I'll talk about briefly. One example of primary sources that uh, you may find useful are at the Massachusetts State Archives in Columbia Point in Dorchester, Massachusetts. And the two collections I've highlighted here include both a list of men who served in the British military organizations from Massachusetts, and it would be also the District of Maine, from 1710 to 1774. And also, your ancestor may have not served in the war, but may have had a direct financial conflict or debt owed to them based to uh, their service and helping. Maybe they boarded soldiers, maybe they lent some horses, whatever the case might be, government responses to petitions and claims for the 17th century may be something you want to examine on 14 reels of film. Tip. I can't stress this enough, and I'll probably sound like um, I'm beating the subject to death, but you really want to adopt your ancestor's regiment. In the case of your ancestor, they may not have a journal. They may not have a diary, but maybe someone they served with does. That's going to add detail. It's going to bring the story back to life for you with the affiliation that maybe even your ancestors mentioned in that diary or letter or account book. You want to research each individual in your ancestor's company. A typical company would often be 100 men or less. You want to look for additional manuscript sources if you can. So try any HGS to search for the company name or the colonel's name. So that way you can see what collections we might have. Do you want to also examine more closely the officers? Because they're more likely to have kept a journal or a diary, or maybe even have correspondence. Look outside of any HGS. Use things such as WorldCat that is going to be um, 
useful for you for published sources, or NUCMUC, the National Union Catalog of Manuscripts. Now, the other thing that you want to look at when you're looking at these muster rolls, as I had mentioned earlier, you might find that some of the names are familiar. Did your ancestor re-enlist with some of his neighbors to fight in a battle that occurred a couple of months later, or maybe a couple of years or decades later? Look closely. You may find that you're not looking just at a bunch of strangers, but people that were in the same church together, worked on the neighboring fields, or in some cases, might even be close cousins. Let's use the NEHDS website, American Ancestors, to undertake a search of colonial war records we have online. We're going to search, click on the search button, and then select the database option above. Now we're going to click on Advanced Search. This will allow you to further narrow down the database relating to military records. We are now going to click the drop-down box for Category. Under Category, we're going to select Military Records. And then to the right of that, under the Category field, we can select under Databases, Colonial Soldiers and Officers in New England, 1620 to 1775. Now, once I have that database selected, you may want to use our available search tips. This will allow you to select volume and page, if you already have a reference to it, or maybe a particular expedition, like the Phipps Expedition to Canada, or the name of the company, or the regiment that your ancestor served in. We can allow deep searching within these collections because they have been transcribed so well. Within this collection, for Massachusetts from 1620 to 1775, include officers and soldiers in the 17th century conflicts. Officers and soldiers uh, from 1702 to 1722. Soldiers in the French and Indian War from 1744 through 1763. Officers and soldiers 1723 to 1743. And lastly, officers and soldiers in the French and Indian Wars 1755 to 56. This is a compilation once in print that is now more easily searchable under one database to make your uh, researching needs complete. Step three, seek out or apply to hereditary societies. Not only to honor your ancestor, but also to many lineage societies are engaged in unique scholarship, pres preservation of marking gravestones, where battlefields were, and most importantly, education, from a primary school level all the way up to college and to actually to genealogists and historians. It's a great way also to connect with other descendants that may be researching people in the same company to help you connect your adopted regiment. What I have here is a list of some of the more typically joined associations in hereditary societies. In fact, the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company, based out of Boston, Massachusetts, located in Battle Hall, was founded back in 1638. It is the oldest military hereditary society in existence in North America. Now, it's a while later when the ladies were allowed. <laughs> in 1927, the National Society of Women Descendants of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company was undertaken. In 1893, the General Society of Colonial Wars was created. In 1932, the National Society of Daughters of Colonial Wars and other affiliated hereditary societies that you may think of joining, or maybe one of your ancestors did, including the National Society of Colonial Daughters of the 17th Century, the Order of Founders and Patriots of America, National Societies of Daughters of Patriots of America, and a couple new kids on the block, including the Continental Society of Sons of Indian Wars, and in the following year, the Continental Society of Daughters of Indian Wars. All of these you may inquire to join. Some are by invitation only, but you can easily find out. And if you have any question on these, feel free to contact us at NEHGS. We'll be glad to put you in contact. We're now going to speak about the American Revolutionary War. I think of no greater part of my own genealogical research was back in the 70s. We were at the height of the bicentennial, and I can remember the stories of my own ancestor told at the dinner table as he marched off to Lexington and Concord. Now, this is where you have to take into consideration family tradition and the loss of how many generations the story may have changed. 
a lot of people will come in with great stories of their ancestors' regiment marching off to the Battle of Lexington and Concord. This is altogether wonderful, and many, many militia units did march to Lexington and Concord. However, if all of the regiments arrived, there would have not been a British army to retreat back to Boston. So chances are your ancestors may have been marching on the alarm and may have met on the battle road afterwards or may have not made it till a little bit later. So look at the distance that it would take to travel to Lexington and Concord before you assume that they were at the Lexington Green that morning. Step one, let's determine if he fought. Too young or too old? Now, unfortunately, in muster rolls, ages are not typically listed. In fact, sometimes the town isn't even given. So if you have a John Smith in your community, you're trying to determine is yours, is it the father, the son, or the grandson? If you find an age or a town, sometimes these are called descriptive roles. They're often later in the war, but they will often sometimes even give physical characteristics and traits, such as the height, the hair and eye color of your ancestor, his occupation, and sometimes where he was born. Age ranges of a typical soldier, I like to say it would be about 18 to 35 years of age. Now, the average date of birth could be to the extremes of 1735 to 1760, but I've also seen extremes as early as the first decade of the 1700s, as well as soldiers that were young men born in the late 1760s. Family relics in the attic. It's quite amazing what things turn up. I've had many people who have come into the library for consultations or just doing research, showing me letters and diaries, photographs of paintings, or telling me about guns and swords that have been passed on over the generations. These are typical artifacts that closely connect us back to the conflict of the Revolutionary War. Perhaps you have something as simple as a discharge paper. The one on the screen now is signed by George Washington. They weren't all that fancy, and they weren't all that pre-printed. What you might find is that you have a simple water-stained photogra photograph available of a discharge that was handwritten, legally allowing your ancestor to leave the military. These documents become even more important when your ancestor applies for a pension, because it's proof that they were honorably discharged. Hopefully you have something like this, or I've seen one. Oral traditions, again, going back to the story of the Battle of Lexington and Concord and all those that may or may not be there at the Green, you have to remember that the stories of 1775 to 2015, that's a lot of time for the story to change. A lot of paths and curves in the road, so something may have been lost or embellished. So your ancestor who heroically fought at a battle may have been a deserter. You want to preserve these stories and keep them important in your genealogy. So one of the things I like to th think is that as a source of oral tradition, write it down exactly how you remember it. Then I want you to footnote it with the name of the relative who told you, maybe your father, your uncle, your great aunt, your grandmother, and approximately when you heard the story first told to you. It could even be in the decade or where you're now putting a source to the oral tradition that when you pass on the story, you have now given a verbatim version. Ask your cousins who may have heard the same story. Compare notes. You might see the story slightly different, but do preserve it. I don't want you to really feel like you're having to prove or disprove your grandmother, but you might want to get the story straight so when you're a grandparent telling this, you're giving the correct story. Cemeteries are wonderful outside museums, and it typically so for the genealogist. Is there a gravestone for your veteran? Well, unfortunately for the colonial conflicts in the Revolutionary War, there weren't always gravestones erected. I have many ancestors who fought from those eras that I don't have any idea where they're buried or assumed where they might be buried. Gravestones were not given by the federal government until the later part of the 19th century, so it's possible that a grave would be marked later on, but it's mostly what would have been marked by the family member. Cemetery and burial records of the 17th and 18th century are also slightly rare. You might have the record of the sexton of the church that your ancestor who had fought in the King of Philip's War was buried in, say, 1705, but it's not going to tell you that it's in Lot 13, Grave 47. 
it's going to be out there somewhere in a graveyard, hopefully with a gravestone. NEHGS has thousands upon thousands of gravestones from New England and abroad that have been transcribed and are searchable on American ancestors. I would like you to make a veil to yourself to search these. You might find the gravestone that you have not visited. Also, keep in mind where the spouse is buried. I have an instance where my colonel in the Revolutionary War doesn't have a marked gravestone. He died in 1811. However, his wife that died in 1775, that was um, his second wife, is buried with a marked stone. Is he buried beside her? Well, there's actually a space. Was there a stone not placed there because he had passed on? There was not enough money in the family. Any questions could perhaps answer this and you could ponder it forever. So think about where the spouse is buried. That's a good clue. Also, is there a flag marker? The Sons of the American Revolution would often mark gravestones in the 19th century. As you can see in the image here of my ancestor, Captain Jonathan Poor's gravestone in Newbury, it's marked by a rusted iron SAR marker. A typical example of it below shows the name of the individual. These to have survived well over a century. Perhaps your ancestor you have a painting of, or a silhouette, but did your ancestor live into the 1830s, the 1840s, or beyond? You might be one of the lucky ones who has a photographic image. Last Man of the Revolution, published by my colleague Maureen Taylor, uh, highlights many of the photographs in my own personal collection. It's a wonderful way of looking back at those who served with Washington and to see a photographic image. What a wonderful way of time traveling. This is now in two editions. A great way of seeing perhaps someone when you adopt their regiment you might find a photograph of him. Hopefully you can find one of your ancestor. Step two, research. One of the things that you want to keep in mind is there are a lot of primary sources that you can tackle for your Revolutionary War ancestor. This includes muster rolls. I spoke about them earlier listing the names. Descriptive muster rolls give more detail. Perhaps you can find in an archive, may it be on the state level, or on a website such as Fold3, the quartermaster rolls. Quartermaster rolls are often very detailed, and if your ancestor received a gun or a jacket or a bedroll, it would be detailed. Or even more so, if he lost them or damaged them, he would be charged accordingly. So you can find the debt and the personal effects given to your ancestor via the quartermaster rolls often. Published genealogies are another good resource. They often will detail the heroic military service of earlier generations. Do take into consideration that many of these are compiled from correspondence, so the sources may not be footnoted. This is where you need to put on your detective hat as a genealogist and seek out where did they find that source. Correspondence from officers, I did speak a little bit about that earlier, whereas your ancestor may have been written up in a letter of accommodation uh, for his her heroism or for some small fight that he had with somebody else. So I find that looking for our ancestors in correspondence of the officers often reveals some interesting stories. Town histories of the 19th and 20th centuries were often laden with wonderful military history chapters, talking of those from previous military conflicts, and often given compilations of muster rolls. Perhaps you'll find a pension file for your ancestor, or a bounty land. For pension files, for the average soldier, were not granted to the Act of 1818, unless you were an officer. So hopefully your ancestor had lived long enough to get it, or perhaps his widow applied. Journals and diaries are another wonderful resource. Again, while you adopt the regiment of your ancestor, you'll want to seek these ones out, not just for your ancestor, for those he served with. The 1840 census, which I'll talk about, is another wonderful resource. Maps, and also, again, tip, which is most important in here, adopt that regiment. Here's an example of a military compilation from the set Massachusetts Soldiers and Sailors in the Revolutionary War. My own ancestor, Jonathan Poor, who I've talked to you about, this is a listing of every entry from particular muster rolls that he had his name mentioned in. So because he was a captain, there's a little bit more. But I'm able to take each one of these lines and find the primary source and look at the muster roll. 
both on Fold 3 or on microfilm at the Mass State Archives to see where he was and to back up each one of these statements. That's what you really want to do. I mentioned the 1840 census. Well, actually, here's a little bit of trivia for you. This is actually one of the first military censuses available. It lists both Revolutionary War pensioners and the widows. It's also applicable for the War of 1812. But for this case of this chapter, let's talk about the 1840 for Rev War. It also is the first census to give the exact age of an individual. Oftentimes, the veterans are listed at the very end of the town, and they are also applicable because the entire census was published in 1840-41. So we have an example here on the screen for Russell County, and Thomas Graves is listed age 77, and also the name of the head of the household that he was living with. So not are you only getting an exact age, which doesn't come across for other members of the family for another 10 years in the 1850 census, you're finding association of someone who might be the son, the son-in-law, the neighbor, or the grandson caring for that veteran. Or in this case, a Thomas Graves, he's probably the head of household himself. Tip, look for diaries of fellow soldiers. Journals and diaries are wonderful. I think that if anything brings a narrative back to life, it's the first-hand account of a veteran who was there. The published journals, may it be from the 17th century right down to 21st, the 21st century, add a personal light onto the story of the battle, the event, or just typical military life. NEHGS does have published journals in both the register and in printed form that were done in the 19th and 20th centuries. Also, look in our archives for tremendous collections of journals and letters that may accompany your research. One thing that you also want to do is look beyond it, um, your own personal collections and think maybe a historical society. So take an email or a jaunt over to a local historical society in the town your ancestor lived in, and you might find that you're going to find a plethora of wonderful documents. On the databases from NEHGS, what I'm simply going to do now is go to Browse Databases. And I have five databases that you might find very useful. This includes an index of Revolutionary War pensions and pensioner receipts. These are found in our rare books collection and are fascinating. They're actually the receipts from the paychecks granted to some Revolutionary War soldiers from 1799 through 1837. It's not every veteran, but it's a good sampling, and you might see the signature of your ancestor on it. And also, Revolutionary War naval pension receipts from 1829 to 32. We also have uh, a collection regarding Weymouth, Massachusetts for soldiers and sailors, specifically from that community. NEHGS uh, is able to help our patrons in-house at our library with commercial databases such as Ancestry.com and one of the affiliate-owned Ancestry databases, Fold3. This will give you Revolutionary War pensions, service records, and Revolutionary War roles to search just by name, and you can see the physical images. So bring your thumb drive when you come, or you can print them out. This is only available in-house. This is not an external database from American Ancestors. So again, I stress you do need to come into the library to see this, but it's a wonderful way of getting the primary sources quickly for a lot of Revolutionary War soldiers. Step three, seek out or apply to hereditary societies. Lineage societies in the Revolutionary War came about actually early on. In the 18th century, in fact, 1783, the Society of the Cincinnati was started by officers of George Washington's Continental Troops. Soon after, sons of the Cincinnati um, were applicable. So if your father had fought and was an officer and had been a member, he could have joined. The organization is alive and well well over 200 years later, and I'm honored to be a life member of the New Hampshire Society of the Cincinnati. Perhaps you or your mother or your sister is a daughter of the American Revolution, or maybe you're a son of the American Revolution. This are These are two of the most popular organizations going, as well as Sons of the Revolution and countless other military organizations that you might find an affiliation with. Give them a try and check their resources and their libraries. They may also unlock clues to further tell the story of your Revolutionary War veteran.
We're going to jump ahead to the 19th century now, and one thing to keep into consideration, whereas French and Indian War veterans often fought in the Rev War, there are also extremes where young soldiers of the Revolutionary War were the lead officers in the War of 1812. In fact, a young Andrew Jackson, who fought as a young man, was a veteran, obviously, and a leading general during this conflict. Step one, determine if he fought. Was your ancestor too young or too old? Ages are not, again, listed typically, as well as the town. So it's the same situation as the Revolutionary War. Again, I like to toss out that the average age that I see is between 18 and 35. Again, there are extremes. Um, average birth year for a War of 1812 veteran tends to be 1775 to 1795. But there are extremes. Again, as I say, Rev War soldiers did fight. Uh, so you have mid-1750s to those born into the late 1790s and actually even beyond. Again, cemetery clues might be what first leads you to know that you have a War of 1812 ancestor. 200 years is a long time for a story to pass down, so maybe the oral tradition your family doesn't seize that information. Is there a gravestone? By the 19th century, um, there are available gravestones being awarded, and for those War of 1812 veterans, a family member could apply. Again, looking for cemetery and burial records, older 19th century cemeteries may be very small in churchyards and not have exact lots, but as the garden cemetery movement of the 1830s moved forward, you would often find strategized plots laid out for cemeteries where you could find exactly where it is, regardless if there was a stone. Where is the spouse buried? Again, keeping that in mind because it could be buried nearby. And is there a flag marker? One thing about flag markers, be careful. Lawnmowers can knock them down. I've seen many flag markers marking veterans of the War of 1812 for children born 50 years later. So be careful where they've replaced the flag marker um, before you salute the stone. Step two, research. There are Plenty of useful resources available for the 19th century conflict of the War of 1812, and a lot of them are quite similar to what you would find for the 18th century conflict of the Revolutionary War. Muster rolls, quartermaster rolls, again, are very valuable and are the primary source we use for their service. Published genealogies are wonderful, again, they're going to narrate a story, perhaps, given by the War of 1812 veteran that may be in a published genealogy. You want to, again, look for the correspondence from the officers, the town histories, again, wonderful ways in the 19th century to recount who was involved with a particular battle in the town. Service records I'll talk a bit about. Pension files as well. Journals and diaries I can't touch uh, any more other than adopt that regiment. You're going to find somebody else may have kept that story if your ancestor didn't. The 1840 census, just a reminder, like those of the Rev War, there are those for pensioners and for their widows. And maps. One of the things I find very useful with maps is if you have place names where the muster took place or where a battle took place, use typical online maps now and look for historic maps to track the route of your ancestors' regiment or the naval engagements they were involved with. What a wonderful way to take a genealogical family field trip. For the records at the National Archives and Records Administration in Washington, D.C., you want to search NARA M602. These are the compiled service military records, which are the actual muster roll sheets for each one of the veterans. Also, you want to look at the War of 1812 pension records, NARA M131. I'm sorry, M313. Um, you can order these originals um, through National Archives Trust Fund Form 85, or you can send an email to inquire at arc2.nara.gov. An example of the M602 are these individual cards done in the late 19th century recounting the muster of each one of your ancestors' service months. It may say if he's present, in the hospital, or unfortunately sometimes dead. So this will give you a compilation that will be together in one docket. The National Archives M313, it will include in his pension the application of the veteran of the widow's uh, claim for the war pension proof of their service, affidavits relating to the claim. So if they had somebody like a doctor or someone who was present with him when an injury occurred, this will be letters of support. Correspondence from the veteran himself, especially if those that didn't get a pension, 
and they kept on claiming. So if you don't see one that was awarded and they did apply, still look at it. In some cases, they're larger. Receipts, it may be a receipt for medical care or even for the casket for the veteran or his widow. Genealogical information runs over plentiful in pension files, especially in War of 1812. We will get dates of marriage, who married them, who was present at the marriage if they have to get an affidavit to prove that they were married. Lists of children, dates of birth, dates of death, and often the death certificates or proof of death of the veteran and or his widow. Through the efforts of FGS, the War of 1812 pensions have been preserved and they are continued to be preserved. As of this current month, there are over 360,000 images searchable and scanned on Fold3.com. Fold3, again, is a commercial website, but the War of 1812 pensions, because of the generosity of members of NEHCS and people in the genealogical community at large, have been able to preserve them, and they're free online. So do look at Fold3.com and see if the pension of your War of 1812 veteran is already there. Step three, seek out hereditary societies to aid you in your search. There are two that come to mind that are most popular. One is the General Society of the War of 1812, and the other is the United States Daughters of the War of 1812 for the female descendants of War of 1812 veterans. Just an interesting uh, snippet of photography once again. Here is an assemblage in 1871 of a variety of veterans from the War of 1812. But if you look at the gentleman right there with the dark bow tie, he looks a little bit younger. Well, he is. That's George Armstrong Custer, who would be um, known for the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. He was active in the military and had served in the Civil War. It's an interesting historical parallel of two errors. Review any HGS resources. Just remember, AmericanAncestors.org has searchable databases. I've outlined some of them, and I want you to dig deeper. And also, when you're adopting the regiment, search on those gentlemen that he served with. Remember, NEHGS, the library.nehgs.org, will list our published resources, our manuscript and archives, and we'll link to our digital resources, which are ever-changing on the face of American ancestors. Also, we have on-site database access to things like Fold3 to search your Revolutionary War pension files and service records. And remember, we have our experts that can help you. This would include both consultations available from genealogists at NEHGS and the services of our trained research service department that will have paid research that can undertake your needs, very commonly used for hereditary society applications. Also keep in mind that we have an Ask a Genealogist email service free for our members, and the address is right below. Thank you, David, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, sorry we had some audio problems early on. Hopefully those haven't been too bad throughout today's presentation. Um, so let's get to your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it in that question panel to the right of your screen. Um, and David will answer as many as he can in about the, let's see, remaining seven minutes or so that we have for this hour. Um, so kind of a general question, but Patricia asks, um, what about women who are mentioned in these records? Um, what, you know, either in journals or maybe the pension files, um, where would you see women mentioned? Obviously, there are patriots, there were women, people like Molly Pitcher and Deborah Sampson, who served uh, as a male soldier uh, in disguise, so she actually got a pension. However, the searchable uh, databases for pensions, such as the Revolutionary War, you can search on the other names associated, so you should be able to find them. I think it's a wonderful way of looking at the journals and the diaries of the ladies associated and the letters they're writing to their soldier that may be preserved. We'll give you the story from the home front, which is the other side of the story. Um, researching the ladies, uh, especially in the pension files, can give you a great detail and may speak to their life that you may have never seen before. It's really a time capsule. Okay. 
Okay, thank you for that question and thanks David for your answer. Um, let's see, we have a question about 1812 pension files. Um, Catherine asks, so to apply for a pension, um, did you have to be needy? There were financial requirements that were put forth. Uh, if you were very wealthy, you probably wouldn't have applied for a pension from the federal government. But I can tell you in later wars, it really didn't matter too much. I don't know if you realize this or not, but General Grant applied for a pension for his Civil War service after he had been president. So it varies. Um, the Revolutionary War pensions, there was actually an act that went forth in 1820 where they asked for your financial wealth. Um, so it talked a little bit about how much your acreage of land you had, et cetera. Um, you may find affidavits in the War of 1812 from neighbors speaking of how impoverished or maybe because of the physical ailment your ancestor could no longer work. So you might find the details hidden within it. But generally speaking, uh, they would qualify in later in years just by um, seniority of age, you often find them requesting them and get being them granted regardless. All right, and here's a great question from Yvette who asks, um, how accurate are town histories um, in general, you know, for use as a source, and what are some red flags for embellished stories? I think that's a great question. Thanks. Really good question, Yvette. Thanks very much for asking that. Um, the embellished stories could be into the correspondence sent to that town historian. So you really do need to be the detective and look if it's a myth. Um, I can tell you I can pull, pull countless town histories off the shelf at any HGS and question the source, and I may not be able to find it because the correspondence to that historian no longer exists. But if you use your genealogical skills to seek out the names and the associated people with that battle, or the events, is there a listing of all those who were at, say, Bunker Hill or at the Battle of Bennington, if that your ancestor claims to be there when the spy Andre was executed? See if you can find that. A lot of times it is oral tradition, and it is just that. But if you can prove it by primary source, you'll strengthen what pages are within the, page, the covers of that history book. All right, thank you. Um, and we have a question from, let's see, uh, Nancy, who asks, uh, what about soldiers who may have returned to their native lands, you know, say Ireland, for instance? Um, besides presence on a roster, what other records, if any, might be, fo might be found for them? Well, that's an interesting question. You often see that in the case of the Civil War where the transatlantic passage is much easier, where they may have fought in the Civil War and retired back home to Ireland or England or wherever they may have came from originally. I don't see that so much for the colonial wars because once you've emigrated, you generally stayed there. I mean, there's obviously cases where they may have moved up to Canada. Um, as far as records associated with the country they went back to, there would have been no claim that they would have had to go through like a military or government office there. Um, you might find that they had previous military service in the country they went back to and um, you find reference to that in the pension file, that they may have fought in the Revolutionary War, they had been a Scottish soldier in the 1750s or 60s and they may detail that. Um, you won't find a lot of soldiers from the 18th and 17th century returning back, but if you do, Feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you about the story because I think it could be quite rather unique. Okay, and we have a question from Cheryl. Um, she says, what about bounty lands for service? Can you kind of touch on that? Before pensions were applicable for um, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, there was often bounty land. Some of the land is given out by the state. Uh, in a more detailed lecture on both Rev War and War of 1812, I would um, expound on this a little bit more, um, but for the limited time, I've kind of shortened it. Uh, it is very important. One thing to keep in mind for the Revolutionary War, there were two fires in Washington. In 1800, there was a fire in the War Department, and then in 1814, when Washington 
D.C. was burnt by the British, the records were lost again then. So the bounty lands, we have bounty land warrant numbers and often no associated paperwork. If a bounty was given after 1814 or was awarded by a state, um, there's a good book by Lloyd Bockstrock on state awarded bounty land that you may find your ancestor in, or you may find the paperwork at the National Archives. This is a wonderful collection that I hope will eventually be digitized and completely searchable. Great, and we actually had um, two questions about this subject that, that came in almost simultaneously from John and Susan who ask about Loyalist soldiers, uh, especially during, of course, the Revolutionary War. Um, what records exist for Loyalist soldiers and um, is there perhaps a database that you could search that you know about? One collection that comes to mind, especially for Massachusetts Loyalists, is a database that was put out at the same time that we did for the Colonial Wars. It's called Divided Hearts, and that will list those who are known to be Loyalists in Massachusetts. Obviously, they came from all over the regions, those loyal to the king, um, either to take up a military interest and fight alongside with British soldiers and the regulars, or to be in a Loyalist regiment. Most of these are very well documented and published. Again, using our website, uh, go to the library catalog and search on Loyalist in the specific state in which your ancestor came from. Besides being a member of the Cincinnati, I could also join the United Empire Loyalist in Canada. My Mills family from Westchester County, New York, were Loyalist and went up to Nova Scotia at the end of the war. So you can find resources on this. The United Empire Loyalist is a hereditary society that you'd want to contact and join. So don't reinvent the wheel. Somebody may have already had a sketch done on them. And feel free to contact us. We can also direct you to sources on Loyalist. Another topic for a further webinar. All right, and maybe just one last question before we wrap up for today. Um, Again, kind of a simultaneous question coming in from um, this time John and Beth, who ask about uh, prisoner records. Um, so either you know uh, British or Scottish prisoners that were perhaps captured at Saratoga, or um, an American patriot who was a prisoner of um, a British ship. Um, what kind of records or suggestions do you have for the for people who are looking for prisoners? A lot of things on the prisoners of war, I'll touch base first with the Americans, um, like the Sugar House in New York and the prison ships that were out there in New York Harbor. Um, a lot of those compilations have already been written up. Now you may find a clue to it in the service records in the muster rolls of your ancestor, it may say absent without leave or captured or prisoner. Uh, his pension may detail his capture and his length of time, so you can get detail that way. The Public Record Office in London do, rather, do have um, records of prisoner of war. In fact, during the War of 1812, many American soldiers were sent to Dartmoor Prison, uh, and those records do exist. In the case of soldiers like Hessians and Germans, and uh, Hessian Germans, Scottish or British regulars that were captured, oftentimes they were traded for um, American troops quickly, so as a prisoner exchange. However, for those that were held, sometimes they were held in homes of farmers and kept as laborers, if you will. Uh, so there are sometimes interesting personal accounts on the town level. I would definitely recommend contacting the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and also state archives um, on the colonial level to see what what examples of records exist. Uh, if you have a particular ancestor in question, um, I'd be delighted to chat with you further on it. All right, well, I think that's all the time that we have for questions. I know that there were a number that we um, weren't able to answer today, but if you have um, if you have more detailed questions about the research that you're undertaking or need some guidance as to you know where to where to look next, um, I do recommend scheduling a consultation um, and you can write to consultations at nehgs.org. There are um, discounts available to members of NEHGS, so I recommend um, perhaps booking a consultation. Um, and then also if you've kind of hit that brick wall or you're ready to kind of pass off your research to someone else, we also have a research for hire uh, service available. Um, you, so 
our research services, you can write to research at nehgs.org, um, and that service also has discounts for NEHGS members. So I just want to thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and um, let us know what you thought about today's webinar. Um, I've also included a question about what uh, military conflict you're most interested in. Um, and based on your responses, we will uh, perhaps and hopefully offer a webinar um, a fuller webinar on that topic in the future. So I hope to see you at uh, future events, either online or in, port in person. Uh, have a great day and goodbye for now.